there was a little bit of a silence there. I had no idea how to start. I am, guys, I am not even numbering our Find Your Film episodes. I need to be more responsible and organized. But everyone, listeners, welcome to another week, another episode of Find Your Film. I am Greg Srizavasti. I am joined by my betters, Bruce Porky. If you, it, first of all, Bruce Porky, if you are watching this YouTube feed, the video feed of our podcast, he's calling him, himself Bruce La Llorona. How's my, how's my accento, accento, Bruce? Is it, is La Llorona, La Llorona okay? Porky, oh, I, I think I spelled it wrong. My actual middle name is Lauren, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a little, little bit of, of a mistake, but you know what? From mistake comes cinema, and you're going to tell us what La Llorona is all about. Maybe it might be one of your picks. Eric Holmes, he, he just jumped in a little bit late to the party, and that was my fault because I sent him a horribly wrong <laughs> Zoom link, so he didn't have time to. He's just Eric Holmes this week. There's no, there's, no, and I'm sure I wouldn't be. Set, I think he's going to take that challenge, and he might change his name during. during yeah, we'll see what happens, or, or, or you will see what <laughs> we'll, you're doing. Fine, Eric Holmes, you're doing all right. Doing, uh, doing good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing pretty good. Yeah, pretty busy week, but uh, pretty yeah, busy still week. got a couple in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eric Holmes is a, a future filmmaker and producer. We, uh, me and Bruce, we say this every week. We've read his script. We love it. And you, you are part of a weekly writers group. Eric, before we get into our movies, do you think what is the basic benefit for you as far as being part of a writers group? What is the advantageous part, especially if you want to create your own material? I, I would say the best thing to do is, well, at least as far as a writers group, um, all the writers are better than me and they're not afraid to tell me when I suck. So once if you can get your ego in check and take criticism well then you're just going to be better not just with writing but with anything and uh it's it's good to it's good to have someone that can be there to keep you in check but not be a dick about it you know like oh, you suck and how do i suck you just suck that's not helpful but it's good to have different points of view and sometimes like you take those notes sometimes you don't but it's good to have it's good to have people that you know are good at what they do kind of steering you in a direction and whether or not you want to go in that direction is up to you. And you don't have a bunch of sugar coders. That's what, I guess, what part of the being part of a writer's group is all about. Just honest. Yeah. Criticism. Well, on, on top of that, like we're all smart enough to know when we wrote something bullshit. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, when you wrote something really bad, and then it comes time for notes and everyone's silent and they're like, you know what you did. <laughs> you know, they're like, yeah, I know what they did. You know what you did. We don't have to go on. <laughs> what we but do yeah. with find, what we're doing with find your film is we, every week we do, we give movie recommendations. We maybe by the end of the episode, we'll have 10 to 12 movie recommendations. Every other week we will also spotlight on a, on special episodes, filmmakers we love our first spotlight for find your film was a couple of episodes ago. We did two, actually two episodes on William Friedkin. Our next director spotlight will be Mario Bava and Dario Argento. It's kind of a mix and match uh, melange. I, I think I use that, that, that uh, word wrong, but Bruce Perky, can you very quickly uh, tell us what to expect, what we can expect from the Bava and Argento episode that is coming to the find your film feed this week. Lots of gloved hands holding knives and lots of color. I'm not talking about you, Bruce. I'm talking about the, <laughs> the, 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 the Oh, the, see, that is a dastardly and, and, and a very evil laugh. By the way, I have seen Blood and Black Lace. Is that the name of the movie, Bruce Correct. Berkey? Oh, and I, I'm not going to spoil and I'm not going to tell you guys what I thought of that Bava film. I'm going to leave that, like Anderson Cowan, our friend would say, I'm going to leave that for the purposes of our show. I, I can't wait to talk about that movie and eventually cram in Suspiria tonight. Also, regarding our, our movie recommendations this week, we will do our, our movie recommendations for this episode. Following week for Find Your Film, we will not do a movie recommendation. We're going to do another director spotlight, and I'll talk about that towards the end of the episode. The reason why is because Eric Holmes, Bruce Perky, and I will will be hosting a podcast called Cinematics. Cinematics has been up and running and uh, headed by Anderson Cowan since 2015. I am his right-hand man for that podcast. But uh, Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky, are, are you ready for, for uh, next week's episode of Cinematics? Um, no. So I apologize ready. in advance. <laughs> 
<laughs> It'll take well, two of us to equal half of Anderson. There you go. Okay. okay. And, and, and you're the half. <laughs> Are you intimidated? Are you intimidated with hosting cinematics with the great... A little, little bit. Uh, I'm the, I, 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 no? I, listen, I listen to cinematics every time. All the all the uh, I've got a new movie to make. So I listen to all the stuff you guys put out, and I'm happy as hell that you asked me to be on it. But man, I was like, I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> so <laughs> well, see what we happens. all know that Eric Holmes and Bruce Perky will mess it up because, first of all, our Find Your Film podcast is E for everything in cinema, and also because it's, it's an explicit show. Cinematics is a clean show by the purposes and the uh, motivations of Anderson Cowan. Very smart about that. And I'm, I'm assuming Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes will probably throw a couple of F and S bombs during the episode, which I'll be fine with. Yeah? I have, to, gonna... have, to, have to bleep those out. <laughs> <laughs> should, should, I mention the, should I mention the game now, or do you want to save it for the episode? We're going to save it for, we're going to save what you're going to do as far as uh, part of charity and as a part of me, a couple right. on the cinematics episode, but <laughs> folks, I think you can tease America. Does it have to deal with donations a little bit? You might it does have to do. It does deal with donations and it also deals with my potty mouth and it, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a tease. Listen <laughs> to the next cinematics. That, dun, that dun, is dun. it. The, that is a tease. I love teases. Also, before we get into our weekly movie recs, we, we did something from our previous podcast, Movie Mainline. We used to do this thing called the Movie Mainline Rewind. We are taking that that part of the show into our show. I don't even know what to call this. Let's just call this Rewind. Bruce Perky, do you have, and Eric Holmes, do you have any rewinds whatsoever for before we launch into our movie recommendations? I do not, Bruce. La I do. Own a Perky? I do. I okay. watched uh, Radioactive, uh, which uh, Eric had watched last week, and uh, I agree with him. It's a solid biopic, uh, better than you might expect. Uh, definitely, the less you know about Marie Curie, the the better. You'll really enjoy uh, finding out and discovering some things there. And as Eric, I was happy to have it not be a full-on romance and actually it it balanced really well the kind of the romance and the personal life of her with the scientific life of her um and it was pretty cool it was pretty good solid i wouldn't say it's spectacular i wouldn't say it blow your socks off but it was um a really good if you're interested in it you'd enjoy it and then i also watched I would say before you go that, you'd mm-hmm. say Radioactive, maybe 3.5 out of 5. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I'd say somewhere in that range, three and a half stars to me. I mean, it's solid, good. Okay. Um, and then I watched the short, uh, P.T. And, P.T. Anderson short. Um, I can remember which order it goes in. I think it's coffee and cigarettes. Cigarettes and coffee. Cigarettes coffee and, and coffee. cigarettes is the was Jarmouche. Jim Jarmouche. See, so yeah, yeah. it's a problem. You can't even search this movie up hardly. You just get Jarmouche <laughs> all over the place. But uh, you can find it on YouTube. And once again, like you said, it's uh, the video quality itself is like ripped from a VHS, but the film quality is superb. And uh, just to reiterate what Eric said, you see all of the DNA of later films for him. And you see um, the, the really precise and impeccable direction he's got there and script writing. And it's one of the few shorts that you'll watch where, you know, it kind of has the twist and you get the, you get the payoff, but it also has enough weird little details that it makes you want to watch it again to kind of un, you know, unravel the puzzles. There's little puzzles kind of built into it too, which is a lot more ambitious than you get in the average short. So uh, I'd say it's worth your time. Did you, did you catch a lot of those uh, transitions I was talking about? Yeah. Like when one group of people were talking and how they transition into the next one. Yeah. And it makes you almost want to go back and rewatch it because you're like, wait, 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 what was he doing there? Oh, now I get how that went. Oh, because at first you kind of see these, there's basically three different conversations, I guess you'd say going on. And they kind of flow back and forth between these conversations. At first you're like, how do these relate? So that's part of the mystery. But then there's also a story within that. Uh, It's, it's really, um, really uh, tight and complex filmmaking for like a first short or an early short by a filmmaker. It's, it's good. I was, I was a bit aghast. I'm going to use the word aghast when Eric Holmes said that cigarettes and coffee made in 1993 released in 1993 as a short is better than hard eight. La Llorona Perky. Is it better 
than hard eight or maybe on the same level because I love when Eric goes out on a limb, uh, goes out on a limb like that. that, that well, I mean, it's always hard to compare a short to a feature film, right? Because a feature film is going to be a little more sprawling a feature films going to have a lot more things involved. So it's, it's tighter and more streamlined. So in that aspect, I think it, it tells the story in a more precise way, I guess. Mm -hmm. So in that okay. aspect, I guess it could be better. Um, and as far as the actual part of the movie of Hard Eight that it kind of is similar to, if you compare those two pieces to each other, I would say that the short is better. Oh, okay. I, I definitely have to see that that short. And before we yeah. get into our movie recommend, our big movie, I don't know, recommend our mo big movie. Real spot. quick. Okay, and this yes, is sir. not to say Hard Eight sucks. That is not okay. what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not saying Hard Eight sucks. I'm saying the short was knocked my socks off, and Hard Eight was still really, really good. Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, there's, yes. there's, PTA, I mentioned it before. It's this weird thing where two things yeah. can both be good. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you're right. You're. Uh, it's fun. You know, PTA. If you if you, that zero percent chance or 0.5 percent chance you're listening to this podcast, PTA. Eric Holmes does, does set, just listen to what he says. Hard eight. It does not suck, but Sydney does. Sydney does. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love these cheap jokes. I apologize. Sydney does not suck. Hard eight is awesome. I need to watch um, cigarettes and coffee. If you flip that around, that might be the. Oh geez, that was pretty hipster. That was good. That was. That was I don't even know what to think about that. That was <laughs> that little little flip kudos, around. Kudos, sir. Uh, kudos. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. Oh, before we go again, not your not the best PTA movie. Personal favorite PTA movie. I'm gonna start first, without any you know, just very quickly. Phantom Thread because it's right up my alley. I, I that is my personal favorite PTA film. Bruce, what what say you? Punch Drunk Love. Okay, oh, just because of the whimsy of it, you just you like that tone, Bruce. It's just such a weird and pure and small, but not small movie. I I I love it, and I love the fact that he tends to like really build like a lot of stuff, but he yeah. keeps it pretty focused. And That's so cool. He, it has such impeccable like music and color design. It's just spectacular. Very cool. Eric Holmes. Well, considering at my uh, Boogie Nights jailhouse, Ted, <laughs> um, of Dirk Diggler, I would have to say Boogie Nights, but I, uh, geez. Oh, that's your I, first I, show, I mean, re right? real, realistically, like Magnolia is great, Punch Drunk Club. And I, I do love uh, Phantom Thread quite a bit. I do too. Yeah. That will be blood. Oh, uh, Phantom you. Thread's one of those like uh, – I'm not a not a fan of those type of period piece type movies at all. Right. But yeah. I I was kind of because I went and saw it with my sister, and my sister loves those type of movies, and it was just weird enough that it kind of oh there was that that uh, there was that that bit where uh, he knew that she was poisoning him, but yeah. then as he was poisoned, he saw his mom like a hallucination of his mom. So it's yeah. like I know you try to kill me but I appreciate what you gave me, even if it was unintentional. And right. so it, it, it was such a, such a weird relationship between the two of them. It's hard not to go back to that one, but I, I, I would have to say Boogie Nights cause I mean, yeah, come on. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. Well, okay. it's, you know, uh, I, I don't want to say this. I, I, I was going to say, now we're going to come down. It, it's hard to come down from a PTA discussion and it's not so fair because our next film that we're going to talk about is a film that all three of us have seen. We, we each got screening links to this movie. This movie is called Spree. It comes out from RLJE Films. It comes out on in theaters, in select theaters, on demand and digital, August 14th. Spree. Okay, and before we get into it, I'm going to get uh, Bruce's quick reaction on this. It just centers on this guy named Kurt, played by Stranger Things actor Joe Keery. He's a 23-year-old kid he, he dry he does a ride share service he's a he's a driver for this ride share service called spree and it's funny because the name of the ride share service is spree but ultimately this guy kurt he goes on a killing spree because he wants to up his that's not a spoiler that's part of the movie that yeah. that's a little bit sort of right so no it, that's exactly what it is that's yeah, the basis yeah. of the movie yeah that's not a spoiler yeah. 
it's pretty. It's 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 you know it's bloody Bruce. What I I Bruce, I saw your 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 YouTube channel review, so I I know what you're gonna say in 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 a little bit. But um, but yeah, so he goes on that spree because he wants to up his follower follower count. He's a social media social influencer. He wants to be he wants to be the center of attention, but no one listens to him. No one watches him. He barely gets double digit double digit views on his live stream. So what can he do? Well, the way to go viral is to ultimately kill people. So that is the quick premise of Spree. I would first off, Bruce La Llorona Perky, you saw it, <laughs> saw it before me. Oh, wait, actually, you, you and Eric probably saw it around the same time. But I think we watched it you. almost at the same time. Yeah. 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 Your initial thoughts, uh, overall thoughts regarding this movie. My overall thoughts was it wasn't terrible and it wasn't great. I, I found it to be kind of mediocre and I felt like a movie like this has to be all in. And I felt like it wasn't brave enough to go all in in any way. And that was kind of my main criticism of it. It's not funny enough. It's not outrageous enough. It's not violent enough. It's not clever enough. It's nothing enough for a movie like this. It's just a little too middle of the road in my book. Is there something that this movie could have done that could have tipped it even slightly where I know you gave it two and a half out of five stars where you could have even just made it to a three or close to three and a half. Is there something, a little thing that they could have done in your opinion? I don't know. I don't think, see, I don't think it had enough of a point of view. Like we needed to know what, I guess I hard to describe. So either all of the people he's after are hateful and the world is terrible and you can kind of root for his efforts because of that, or he's absolutely undeniably deranged and you're almost rooting for the anti-hero side of it in that sense. But in the, it, he's kind of normal. He's not really outrageous. He's not really super crazy. And the people he gets are somewhat stereotypical, but they're not outrageously horrible or good either. So to mm. me, I just, the stakes weren't clear or divisive enough to get you to to pick a side um and i think that was to me its ultimate failing especially in comparison to to me the two basic movies that you compare it to the loser that wants to be famous rupert pupkin king of comedy one of the most pathetic awkward movies ever but awesome or <laughs> one of the most outrageous killings killing spree um viral fame movies ever natural born killers which is over the top in every single way and it's not even close to either of those so okay fair enough fair enough cool um good review eric holmes your thoughts overall thoughts on spree by the way the movie also stars david arquette as the father of kurt well, uh, first of all, I apologize in advance as they're listening to explosions in the movie in the next room over. So if you hear <laughs> if you hear loud that's, booms, that's part of the ambiance. For that. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I I don't know. I I like this movie. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I was a little annoyed when I saw that it was going to be like one of those, uh, you know, the whole movie takes place on a phone sort of thing, uh, yeah. found footage ish. Right. Um. But, you know, I went, once I saw it was at, it was kind of like, oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, I, I turned, it turned out I, I kept, uh, it kept pulling me in and it just kept, you know, kept escalating for me. I was like, oh, let's see where this is going. Oh, okay, that's cool. That's cool. And uh, I, I was thinking of another movie um, you guys may have seen called Groupers. Oh, yeah. um, Groupers there's a uh, character time. named Oren. And I won't go much more into it because if you haven't seen Groupers, that'd probably be a spoiler. But uh, the main character in Spree, which is, by the way, my second favorite uh, tart flavored, uh, fruit flavored candy. Um, <laughs> but uh, Oren in, in uh, this character reminded me, this movie reminded me of if they did a spinoff with Oren, this is kind of in the wheelhouse of what that movie might be. And so yeah. I kept thinking of it like that. I think that's what made me like it a little more than maybe I should have. But I, 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 I again, like uh, Bruce, uh, like Bruce pointed out, there was, uh, there was, there's definitely a lot of uh, potential to kind of take it up to that next level. And 
they kind of never really did. But I don't know. I I, I didn't hate it. I like I I I'd, I'd watch it again for sure. Um, mm-hmm. and I definitely liked it a lot more than I thought. Uh, one thing that kind of bugged me at the beginning was uh, I wish they would have. Uh, I wish the movie wasn't afraid to let the main character be an asshole. Yes. He was he was an asshole, but they they try to like uh the first person he kills is like um oh he's going to, you know, it it sets up what he's going to try to do. Oh, he's going to, you know, he's poisoning the drinks, he's going to kill this guy. Yeah. And uh by, you know, he's going to take a drink of water. Don't drink any water in a uh, lift or an uber by the way yeah um, <laughs> yes, yes. uh but uh they, i mean they set it up but then right before uh right before he gets poisoned he's like oh the white brotherhood oh okay he's a racist so it's it's cool that he kills him which you know i'm not gonna argue too hard about it but i think it would have been a lot more interesting if they would have committed to him killing people for likes and were following a villain as opposed yeah. to trying to make this villain, I, he's not a good guy. He's a murderer, flat out. And so the fact that they have to make his victims bigger, you know, also assholes, seems kind of like a cop out a little bit. Sure, just, sure. Just, I mean, they look, they did it with the Joker. All right, Joker's not a good guy, but we, you know, we follow him around anyway because that's what the movie is. A spree is a movie about a self-obsessed asshole going around killing people for likes. That's not a good person. There's no need. To, there's no need to uh, soften the blow by making his passengers also hateful. Just make them likable, and then so you really get into uh, what I would have liked to see was them get into like lean into him being the asshole, make his victims like just people that were there, and then maybe maybe there's a point. Actually, there is a point at then. Um, don't want to get too much into it, but uh, there's a uh, someone calls him out. We'll say that. I think you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Someone calls him out, and there's like this little bit of reflection. And I'm like, oh, oh, th- this is the part where he's going to have the, you know, I better stop there. But that's the point. Like the point from then on is where they could have taken it to a really interesting direction. But I mean, as it is, it it was it held my attention and was still fun, and I I would watch it again. And I would recommend other people giving it a shot. Wow, very cool. That that is a fair fair minded review, Eric. Uh, Bruce, we're going to say something. Oh, I was going to say. I wonder, and I'm not, I'm just guessing, but I'm wondering if the actor who's kind of beloved and kind of plays a certain type of character in Stranger Things and is known for that. I wonder if it was hard to like maybe let that actor go all the way sure. in that direction yeah. Yeah. because I, I agree with you that was one of the like one of the things i would say is that that would be one direction to take it one way or another so it makes it a little more biting because i think it has to be it wants to be a social satire obviously it needs to be a little more biting to be a really really effective satire in my book once again yeah. well yeah, this, I, was, I, this we, was also this was also kind of the same problem i had with the hunt um well no i, I take that back the, the problem i had with the hunt was uh it didn't. It uh, it had a uh, bad points of view on both sides. It's not the uh, what they call them straw men. It's mm. not the side that those sides would actually take. This was uh, it. It understood the, not even that it understood the sides. It just didn't. It, it didn't really take a strong stance either way. It was right. I want I want likes and views. Okay, we know it. You're an asshole. So there's not really much social satire beyond that. Right. Yeah, I I really li- I, you know I like the movie. I would give it three point five out of five. I I think the reason why I like the movie is because I related to Kurt not in the killing sense. I related to him him being a desperate content creator. I have literally thought about using the word follow for a follow. I have not <laughs> used follow. I have not done the f- please follow my YouTube channel and I'll follow yours. I don't think I've done that. If I did do that, I po- I apologize. There's another thing he says that Kurt says, oh, hey, when you check out my video or something, go smash a like. I've said smash a like before because everyone says smash a like on YouTube. I In the live stream stuff, I barely know how live stream works, but I've, I've been to my share of live streams and it was really cool actually 
reading the comments section because the comment section in Spree is sort of another character where he's actually live streaming his his journey throughout the, the 24 hour period. You get to see him up close and personal accosting a lot of people or just going maybe crazy. And you see these people commenting. I thought it was, I, I really related to the whole destructive side of social media aspect to it. And I think that's why I really plugged into Spree where I will agree with you guys is I do wish it went up another level as far as just pushing the envelope. The people, to your point, Eric, the people who actually went in the car, I liked I liked seeing Misha Barton. I like seeing Frankie Grande because Frankie, Gond- Frankie uh, Grande is, you know, he's Ariana's brother. And um, I, I like Big Brother. I liked him on Big Brother. I liked seeing the guest stars on The Passengers and they're working actors. But the director, who's the director? Eugene... Kotli Yarenko, he could have done a little bit more with having the passengers be more than just your average two-dimensional rote passengers who are disposable. If you're going to have a character who's ultimately disposable for a certain scene, make that disposable character memorable. So when they probably do get disposed, it's an interesting interaction. So I wish there was a little bit more of a punch regarding the passengers that you actually not felt something or was interested in these passengers. Um, ultimately, though, I think the good parts is Joe Keery, I thought he had a really good performance as Kurt because you really catch that air, that desperation in him. And then you were alluding to the comic, Eric Holmes, about uh, the comic played by Sashir Zamata. Oh. Sashir oh, yeah. Zamata. She's an S- uh, SNL alum, and she yeah. was very good as the yes. comedian in the film and eventually the comedian and the social media influencer, Kurt, they ultimately, they, they come to, they have that inevitable face to face and showdown. And I liked it when the movie actually veered off and explored her own journey and the harassment she receives as a comic. I thought actually that would have been an interesting movie. (laughs) Her character's journey. Honestly, she's the most interesting character in the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really? yeah, but um, so yeah, would, Spree, any final thoughts, uh, Eric? You, I want to. Uh, there's a couple things. One, if you li- if you watch Saturday Night Live, uh, Kyle Mooney is in this movie. Yes, he is. And if you're if you're a fan of his character Bruce Chandling, which I am, <laughs> huge fan, uh, he basically not exactly, but he kind of pulls a Bruce Chandling routine, and that alone is worth watching. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Second of all, you brought up the uh, the comments section. Yeah. And I kind of want to watch it again to look at the comments section. And I don't know if the movie did this, but I'm, I'm just going to do a quick rewrite here in case they did not do it. Maybe they did, and there's an Easter egg that I missed. But wouldn't that be cool if in that comment section it's like, because you see it and it's like, oh, my God, is that so-and-so? Oh, my God, you killed her. This is all fake. you know. So, so. But wouldn't that be cool if you had like a couple of the commenters like having a continuing dialogue you wouldn't know it right away but oh, if yeah. you're paying attention to the comment section it's like uh magnolia fan 69 and thunderbutt 87 are just keep going back and forth about you know why captain america's civil war is the best or the worst <laughs> movie ever. or just something like fun like that would have been cool um and who knows maybe that's in there but I, once you mentioned that i was like yeah, i should probably go back and like just actually just read the comment section to see what a fun thing it is. And after you smash that like, get down in our comment section. No, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like for like. Eric, that is such an interesting thing you said about the comment section. And again, I like Spree, uh, but I hope the movie has a lot more nuance like you were saying. Maybe there's some extra comments up. Hopefully. I, yeah. I think there's a lot of things to like about Spree. But to, again, yeah. Bruce, to your point, I wish it, it, they, they ramped it up just a little I, bit more I, I i think it comes down to like uh if this was just uh set up like uh um not even like with the uh you know quote unquote so like if it didn't set up the social commentary of social media wow um but if it didn't set that up and it was just guy uber driver killing people and it just and that's all it was that would have been fine but it, it it almost has like this this tiny spark that it, it's trying to be more than that and then so now you're left with, um, oh, this isn't just a fun slasher movie anymore. 
this has something with a lot of potential. And so when it doesn't reach that potential, it gets a little disappointing. Yeah. But um, so like, I, I, I guess I would say if you, if you're not going to go for it, maybe just cut that part out altogether and just go straight on slasher. Cause if that's what it was, it'd be like best slasher I've I seen have, in a while. I but, have since, a but since it had that little bit to it, a little bit more and I saw the potential, it's like, ah, you could have got there. You could have got there. See, Eric, you, you liked it. I liked it a little bit better than you. And I think the flip side is I saw this movie as more of a social media expose thing yeah. that had a light coating, like an emperor's new clothes of being a slasher creep kind of kind of movie, like one of those things. Yeah. And it used that. It, it, it didn't really pay attention to those to those tropes as well. I think it was more, it was trying to make more of a statement. And I think you said a little bit about that in your review, Bruce, you were, you were wishing it was a little bit more of that straight yeah. up horror thriller. Well, yeah. like I said, I, I one, or the way other. one or the oh, other, right. I think it should go one way or yeah. the other way, but it just kind of, it kind of went right down the middle of the road, which I think Eric is saying sort of the same thing as I am basically that it just doesn't. A little quite... bit. I, I, I see it. I, I, I see it the exact opposite way that Greg does. I see it as a, a slasher yeah. movie with like a, the all, you know, just kind of barely dipping its toe in social satire. Yeah. It's yeah. like just, and, and to your point, Bruce, just jump in, go for it. Yeah. If you're going to go for it, fucking go for it. Right. Or, Speaking or if you're not going to go for it, take it out and go the other way. You know? You, know, you know what movie really went for it? The Kyle Mooney film from 2017. <laughs> Rigsby Bear, <laughs> yes. folks. Yes. If, Bruce, can we can we all co-sign on that movie? I have not seen it. Oh, I awesome. want to see it. I want to see oh. it. I have not seen it. This is a Bruce Perky film, folks. I'm sure. This is, and if you have not, listeners, if you have not seen Brigsby Bear, I, I, that's 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 on you because that's a very special film. Mark Hamill is quite the man in that, and Kyle. Oh man, I love that film. Okay, speaking of films, Eric Holmes, what is? Let's start you off with some uh, movie picks. All right. So, uh, what 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 do we want to do here? We got a. I'll just get this out of the way. <laughs> no. That sounds uh, encouraging. That sounds very encouraging. All right. There's this uh, series on Netflix that uh, came out in 2020. Uh, it's uh, starring Optimus Prime, Bumblebee. <laughs> Is Bumblebee and Optimus uh, Prime? It's called Transformers War for Cybertron Siege. And uh, it's uh, look. Here, when I grew up, I grew up with Transformers and G.I. Joe. And I, I loved Transformers growing up. And I always had in my head, like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to see a live action Transformers? And then life has this weird way of, you know, coming around and it answers your prayers sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes those prayers are not prayers at all. They just poop in your face. And that's exactly <laughs> what Michael Bay did. For 14 movies, maybe 27. I don't know. I stopped watching them a long time ago. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the idea of a Transformers movie, uh, a good live action Transformers movie, my hope and dream as a child that was raped by Michael Bay, pulled my pants down and <laughs> raped those dreams. That was very graphic, those, Eric Holmes. You're supposed to save that for cinematics. Happy. Cinematics. That's cinematic <laughs> talk. <laughs> Those dreams are sad. That child is dead. Oh. And I lost my love for Transformers. Wait a second. Wasn't the first Until one Until I saw okay? this movie. <laughs> wait, wait. The first one, wait. The first Transformers was good though, right? Eric Holmes a little bit? No? No. The, the cartoon with the, the first, I mean, the first Michael Bay Transformers. You, <laughs> I don't know. No? No? <laughs> no okay, no, no, no. Okay, no. Okay, I was, no. I was thinking I, maybe, I, you'd, maybe you'd give an out on the first one. Okay. Yeah, the, the first movie looked like they rolled a the camera down a hill in a pile of trash. <laughs> um. <laughs> <laughs> and I, have the I, trash I, tell I, racist I, jokes I, to each I, other I, yeah it's so <laughs> but this is you not know another stereotype of black people in mexican <laughs> but yeah that's yeah that's god damn okay so I'll, i'm gonna get off that transformers so good yeah so michael bay pretty much ruined transformers for me I, I stopped caring but then i saw the uh and then like the bumblebee movie came out and people were like oh no really it's good and the first five minutes was pretty cool because it's kind of what i was hoping it would be transformers fighting people and then it turned into Lady Bird after that and you know Lady Bird's fine but when i watch a transformers movie i'm not like i hope this is exactly like Lady Bird. 
but with Transformers at the beginning. That is not at all what I was thinking of. And so they got Transformers War for Cybertron and all takes place on Cybertron. And then that little child pulled his pants up, you know, cleaned himself off and was happy again. Oh, this could be a Transformers movie I like. This could be the thing I've been waiting for since I was a child. And it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. There were six episodes, half hour each, so it's about three hours running time. And, uh, you know, it's it's not, you know, it's still a silly kids movie. But, uh, you know, it kind of awakened that little inner child of mine a little bit. And, uh, yeah. If you like Transformers as a kid, I would check it out. You won't hate this. Uh, if you love the, the Michael Bay Transformers movie, um, you'll watch anything. So go ahead and watch this or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> <okay>. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would give it a shot. That one here, I, I would say this: put uh, if you're at all a fan of Transformers, just put it on. If you're ten minutes in and you're not feeling it, it just bail. You're not gonna, you're not gonna, you know, get into it. Uh, but if you put it in, you're like, oh yeah, this is Transformers. I remember this is this is kind of what I wanted. Maybe watch the rest of the episodes, and it's you know, it's not bad. It's not trying to rewrite history, but you know, it, it does what it does well. Is it just a one shot, meaning the, these three hours, these six episodes, it's just a, a self-contained series or do I you think, think, I think it's a, uh, mini series trilogy, maybe okay. like, I think they're going to do, I, I would assume, I don't know, but I assume it's going to be these six episodes, then they'll release six more and then they'll release the last six. So right. probably three cool. seasons, I guess. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah, it was, it was fine. Cool. All right. So Transformers so War. Bob, get in Trump. there and bust these deceptive chops. That was my best iron. <laughs> it's very good. Very nice. Transformers <laughs> War for Cybertron trilogy with a little bit of VO from Eric Holmes. It is now available via Netflix. So, um, and if you're looking for the other Transformers films directed by Michael Bay, do not ask Eric Holmes where they, where, where one could find them because he'd probably lead you to a, to the wrong place. So Look, if you're five years old and you love them, more power to you. You also like, you know, eating your own boogers and <laughs> never mind. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Bruce Perky. Yes. Um, well, yes. Yeah, so we're all grown ups. We don't like to eat our own boogers anymore. Um, I do. I, I, one of these days, you do. Okay. Eric Holmes, one of these days when several years from now when when we're making millions and millions of dollars from this podcast and we all hate each other i'm gonna spoiler alert i'm gonna do a michael bay director spotlight and you're gonna have to sit through it how's that all right <laughs> bruce perky what do you what do you have for us uh, I, can lie for, I, I, I can lie my way through that spotlight <laughs> yeah really what do you got for us what do you got uh, well, like Rona perky <laughs> Well, in much the same way that Eric had to wash the bad taste of the old Michael Bay Transformer movies out of his mouth, I had to wash the taste of Shia LaBeouf's creeper performance from last week out of my brain. Oh, so I had to I, go. I, you're, 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 the Wi-Fi here, hello? Is it, it's not coming through? <laughs> Eric, did you hear what he said? Did you hear what Bruce Perky said about I, I don't know. He cut out. He cut out. I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> So oh, I sorry, had to Bruce, but... finally catch up with 2019's Peanut Butter Falcon. Wait, what do you mean catch up? Wait, you... I've never seen it before. Wow, okay. Yeah. So And it just dropped on Amazon Prime. So if okay. anyone hasn't seen it from last year, it is available to watch for relatively free if you have Amazon Prime. Um, we've all seen it, I know. Not much, much to say about it other than it's a pretty awesome movie. Uh, it is directed by Tyler Nilsson and Michael Schwartz. Uh, of course, it stars the awesome Shia LaBeouf, Shia LaBeouf, playing a character that is not Creeper. He plays Tyler. It's got the awesome Bruce Dern. It's got the uh, sometimes awesome Dakota Johnson, and she's really good in this. And she's it's this got show. Zach that is played by Zach Gotsigan. And uh, it's an amazing movie. This is one of the best road movies, uh, friends on the road kind of movies that I think you could possibly watch. I, I almost defy anyone to hate this movie, but you know, maybe one of you guys does hate this movie. I, I don't know how you could. 
Um, yeah. Thumbnail sketch. Uh, Zach is a, a man with Down syndrome stuck in an old folks home and he dreams of becoming a professional wrestler. And much like, uh, much like the end of uh, Cuckoo's Nest, he breaks out and runs away. Uh, runs away in his underwear, his tidy whities And he goes off and he encounters Tyler, who is also on the run for other reasons. And these two odd couple people, you know, one's just kind of a good old boy, sort of fishing dude that gets in trouble a lot. And Zach is this kind of has this kid with a dream, you know, a guy with a man with a dream to become a wrestler and they go off on a journey and that's pretty much it. And it doesn't feel the need to like rush there. It just takes its time and it lets you really get to know the characters and the characters are awesome. And there's many other cool characters in the movie as well. Um, it's, it's lovely. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's just a likable, I mean, Dakota Johnson, yeah. what, whatever you think of her, she's so likable in this movie. Shia LaBeouf. Whether you love Tax Collector or not, whether you love Fury, whether you love any of his movies, this is probably his most likable performance down pat. I mean, bar none, right? And Zach is the one who steals the show. So I think it's a near perfect movie. And obviously, uh, Thomas Hayden Church, he also yes. plays this wrestler named the Saltwater Redneck. Mm-hmm. And Thomas Hayden Church, I think, is a national treasure. I just love, well, I guess we're all going to co sign on how awesome Thomas Hayden Church is. Uh, Eric Holmes, did you love the Peanut Butter Falcon as well? Is this, um... I've never seen the Peanut Butter Falcon. Oh my goodness! So you... I will have to. I will have to. Is it? You I'm do. guessing that one's a real tearjerker. No. Well, no. Well, Not I... even like happy tears. They, they... Yeah, you might get a little. There might be a moment here and there. Because yeah. like uh, 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 one movie I seen pretty recently was the uh, Troop Zero, and yeah. that that was that was one of those movies where it yeah. wasn't sad at all. But it, it was like one of those movies that made me feel so good that I started like getting getting really yeah. messy. Is that kind of what the, this, what this could one is? totally do that to you for sure? And one okay. of the things I read I about this this one thing I love and I haven't ever mentioned this before, but Amazon Prime and I know you guys have watched movies on Amazon Prime before. One thing I love about love it service. Love is it. trivia. They give you trivia on the movies if you want to read it. So I usually will watch a movie and if I like the movie, I'll go back and I'll just look at the trivia. And this one talked about how the directors met Zach at a camp. And the camp was one of those, it was a camp for uh, people with different disabilities, plus just other people, I guess. And they met Zach and Zach just went on and on about his dream to become an actor and to be a star. So essentially it's the same story, but instead of becoming a wrestler, he wanted to become a star and that inspired them. And that became the impetus to make this movie. So it's, it's beautiful. You're going to love this movie. Eric, you got to watch yeah. it. Eric, did you grow up liking wrestling, like Jake the Snake Roberts, guys like that? or I was an Ultimate Warrior guy and the Rockers and Roddy Roddy Piper. and like yeah, that, The Iron Sheik, one, one, Bob Backlund, once they, that kind of guy, I, those guys. I, I liked Goldberg when he came in just because mm-hmm. they had the whole thing like, oh, he can't be defeated. So yeah. that was kind of fun. But that's kind of where I started to fall off. Um, okay. I was not a fan of The Rock or Stone Cold or anything like that. I was, you know, Rock's fine now as an actor, but like, yeah. Bruce, Bruce were you a wrestling up. guy growing up? Bruce Berkey, were you wrestling? I was a wrestling guy for a while, but like early, like Atlanta wrestling, when everyone used to get, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And this is like early era, like the great Kabuki and uh, wow. Dusty Rhodes. But then Dusty also Rhodes. they they had um, Rowdy Rowdy Piper was in there too. And you had a bunch of those guys. And uh, I used to like it back in those days. Um, Yo, Mascaras. Yeah. yeah. All, those guys, all, I, those, all those guys. I, yes, if you're I, a wrestling I, fan, you're going to love this. You're going to love this movie, Eric Holmes. I, I would say that uh, the, my love of wrestling kind of uh, transferred to, they got the uh, movie Trivia Schmodown, if you watch that on the YouTubes. And uh, it's got everything I loved about the 80s wrestling, but they moved it to movie trivia, which sounds stupid, but it kind of, it, it's You got to check that out. Yeah, I've, I've definitely got to check that out. Now, um, whose turn? Eric, got yes. something? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let uh, Bruce jump in on this with me. I saw a movie from 1981 directed by Abel Ferrara and written by Nicholas St. John. And this movie is called Ms. 45. And let me pull up this thing. 
Miss a Ford. timid and mute seamstress goes insane after being attacked and raped twice in one day, in which she takes to the streets of New York City after dark and randomly shoots men with a forty-five caliber pistol. She <laughs> is Ms. 45. And that's my pitch uh, reading for the uh, <laughs> uh, starring Zoe Lund is a mute and it's just as I said, she got uh, raped twice in a day and she wasn't going to take it anymore. Um, she just kind of goes around starting killing people. And unlike uh, Spree, which again, second favorite tart, uh, fruit flavored candy of mine. <laughs> um, this one, uh the, the 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 first you know first person she kills is the one that rapes her uh <laughs> yes she does it with an iron pointy side down <laughs> and that was that was you know As you anytime, do. <laughs> anytime you can see a rapist just get smashed to death with a with a iron yes hey yes started a movie off great um and then the next uh, couple people she um kills are potential rapists. They they don't quite get all the way there. And then um it's it's weird because they she just starts getting like a taste for blood at some point. And now she's just killing everybody. And so it, it starts off as a it starts off like she's this uh, uh like what do you call it like le- urban legend hero sort of thing. But then uh as it goes on, you realize, oh no, she's she's just a murderer, you know. It I I, and it does it in you know it slips into that so smoothly that it's hard to figure out a point. I mean, I think the point that would turn most people is when uh, she walks a dog. We'll leave it there, and then you know it does something else at the end. But um, yeah, this this uh this, this kind of puts you on her side and then slowly takes any goodwill you have for her away from you. And mm. it's, it's, it's a really interesting take on this reminded me a lot of thriller, a cruel picture um, where, you know, she gets, uh, she uh, gets knocked out by this guy and uh, uh, addicted to, you know, he starts injecting her with heroin. So she's addicted to heroin and now she's kind of, you know, a uh, prostitute for her. And then she learns to fight her way out. But then she's always fighting bad guys. In this one, uh, Zoe, the character Zoe Lund plays, um, you know, she starts off as like a death proof sort of situation. And then she just slowly just turns into a murderer, like mm-hmm. with uh, with no redeeming value. And it's, it's just really interesting how they how they did that character arc and not at all what I expected. So just ran- was just a random far. view. Was this a random view for you, Eric, or did you spit just like able <laughs> kind of, films? Kind or? of. Uh, my friend Aaron Kessler just at, at a random, he like text like, "Have you seen Driller Killer?" I'm like, "Oh fuck yeah, I love Driller Killer." Um, another Abel for, Abel Ferrara movie, and Driller Killer sounds like a cheesy slasher movie, like a Tromaville type movie. Yeah, that's what it it's sounds, yeah. a lot closer to Taxi Driver. Yeah, oh. you wouldn't think that. You would think Driller Killer. Oh, it's probably like Nail Gun Massacre. It is not. Uh, Driller Killer is a lot closer to like Taxi Driver or even this, Ms. 45. But I was like looking up Abel Ferrara movies and I saw Ms. 45 and I looked at the I looked at the uh, trailer for it on YouTube because I spend all my time on YouTube. And uh, I was like, dude, that movie looks pretty sweet. And it turned out not to be at all the movie I was expecting, but I was pretty pleasantly surprised with it. Cool. Yeah, Bruce Perky. So you can you also agree with this on regarding Abel Ferrara and Miss Forty Five? Maybe yep. it's been a, a, several years since you've seen his movie, these movies, or yeah, it's been a on? long time since I've seen it. But I remember in the day that this was probably my my favorite Abel Ferrara movie because it's the most. It's kind of it's a straight up exploitation movie in style, but it's definitely weirdly unique in the same ways that Eric describes. It also feels like one of those movies that definitely Tarantino has come across this movie a few times in his life because there's some there's some stylish stuff at the end of this when she's kind of whole hog. Um, there's a certain way that she dresses up and does things that's that's very um, very unique and very uh, memorable. Uh, I I like it quite a bit. Uh, it's a really good movie. Not for I, everybody. I though. mentioned this too. Uh, I mentioned yeah. this to Aaron about Abel Ferrara, but his movies have like a certain uh, 
certain look to them. Mm-hmm. And I, I think I said it's it's as if uh, instead of shooting on film, he shot his movie with strips of dirt because it's just yeah. really grimy looking. Sure, and like sure. it's it has a certain as uh, certain look to it that uh, I think really only comes from his movies, and it kind of yeah. gives it. And oh, I almost forgot to mention this. It also uh, you you both seen Uncut Gems, right? Yes. Yeah. Now that movie's just relentless, like people constantly talking and interrupting, cool. kind of like what I've been doing all this episode. <laughs> and and it's kind of like, it, like you just want to, you just want Adam Sandler's character to just get through the thing or talk to the person or smooth whatever out, but you can't because there's always people on all ends. And it's just, it's just, it, it's got that visceral uh, kind of what's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, a visceral, yeah, mm, yeah. There, there's a nature to um uncut gems that i'm like i've never seen a movie like that this movie is real similar that because there's always point. stuff going on there's always a dog barking there's always like people like hey baby hey baby hey baby or like uh, there's always like a constant like rattling noise in the background like there's always something going on that just kind of at, at least for me it just always kept me on edge like you know, I, was, I think we just, can safely assume that the safties were growing up influenced by Abel Ferrara, Bruce, would I, you think about that? Yeah. Or, yeah, yeah, well, and all I'd those. This is so. this is definitely a lot of his stuff is in that same boat of like that that New York of like Taxi Driver and the Warriors and like you know I don't know Death Wish like that real grimy, dirty, dangerous city. He has a lot of that stuff going on and that kind of noise that goes with it, right? And that's kind of the, the Safdie brothers kind of tap into that too. It's a, it's a newer version of it, but it has that feel, you know, like good times, you know, when they're running around in that movie, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. I, I can see like an Abel Ferrara movie and I don't know if he's made this cause I haven't seen all of them, but I could see Abel Ferrara making a movie where the pedophile would be the most likable character in the movie. Yeah. Like there's yeah. that kind of, there's that kind of grime and like, darkness to it i mean yeah, King i don't, of know, if New York, that, I don't whole, know if that sold anyone on <laughs> i mean thing. his most i guess one of his most palatable films i guess with yeah. the king of new york and throughout the entire movie you're rooting for the king of new york who he's pretty much a sociopathic killer who, who is probably the, his his big advantage is he's smarter than everyone he's smarter than the 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 crooks who are trying to bring him down and he's smarter than the cops and the whole movie of king of new york is you're watching chris walken uh, and his and his cronies just dispatch of all the people who are in their way it's a great movie so it just makes begs the question after something like king of new york ferrara had the talent to actually make studio films he has a skill but you got to credit him because he's always stayed true to those indie roots and making films that he wants to make so yeah no he, he yeah so cool bruce what you're next what, what else you got well uh, good to my name i'm gonna do uh, la llorona and of course this is my shutter pick of the week since i seem to have one every week so you know what what can i do to not have one um, this is not The Curse of La Llorona, which was a Blumhouse pick from about a year ago, which I never even saw, but was, from all accounts, terrible. Um, this is actually a really interesting, not even hardly a horror movie. Um, it's directed by, and I don't, I'm not going to say this name right at all. His first name is J-A-Y-R-O. I don't know if it's Jairo or Jairo uh, Bustamante. And... Um, Basically, the concept is this. So if you know the La Llorona story, um, you know, the very famous folktale, I won't go into it for you. So if you don't know it, you can discover it. But if you do know it, this is a definitely a revisionist version of that tale. So it doesn't follow right down the same normal lines as La Llorona usually does. The basic concept of this movie is it starts out um, with this old, almost like grandpa looking guy And he's got three generations of women in his family. You know, he's got his wife and his daughter and his granddaughter. And he is being tried for genocide in Guatemala. Uh, And if you go back and look, Guatemala has a history of this, of basically there was kind of an ethnic cleansing of the ethnically Mayan uh, groups in the northern area of Guatemala Guatemala, uh, to basically clear the land so they could, you know, get, get places to go and get oil and all this kind of stuff. So basically the same story that's been told the world over, you know, 
you know, the powerful people get rid of the indigenous people and, and wipe them out. So basically at the beginning of this movie, he's being tried uh, for genocide. And then most of the rest of the movie, they are kind of holed up in their big mansion because they're very rich. He has been a general in the army. He's, he's you know, made his way in the world. And um, kind of how he, the past, his ha past has haunted them is kind of comes to seep down into every aspect of that family in that house. And it's really some interesting things in this. The most interesting thing I thought, and some people have hated it, I really liked it. The entire movie, there is a soundtrack, but also almost the entire movie, there is a crowd outside of this manor. And they're either chanting or they're beating drums or they're singing. I mean, they're basically calling for him to be, you know, convicted for this crime. And that sound is constantly in the background. Like they can't escape it. And it's almost in a way, almost like a zombie movie in a sense, you know, like how you're like, you're like boarded up in a house from the zombies, but instead mm -hmm. it's actually protesters out there the whole time. That's very um, cool actually. Yeah. It's really interesting how it's done. And then the other main aspect of the story, and then I won't, go into too much more of it but the other main aspect of the story is right after this basic you know all these people come out and testify against him the entire staff except for one woman quits because they're all indigenous people so the indigenous mayan people tend to be servants for the rich people in this society so they all quit they're like nope we're out um and but one woman comes through the crowd a younger woman and she's also from the same culture and she comes in and joins the house staff as a new staff member but she is obviously different she's weird mm -hmm. she's very quiet she's very moody and the question is what is she doing there and she's kind of the catalyst to make all of this stuff kind of come out of the woodwork is it um, a, well it has all the um, the ambient noises outside mm -hmm. Do, is it a slow burn type of yeah. movie or does it okay for and, sure Okay. And yeah, does it, when the dominoes fall, is it worth all of that slowness and pacing? And everything? I think it is. I definitely think it's not for everyone. I mean, we've been seeing a lot of these movies lately. I, I really kind of can dig these kind of movies personally. Sure, um, yeah. It is not a jump scare movie. It's, it's a very um, kind of a slow, slow burn, creepy burn, and you're not sure where it's all leading to. And I think where it leads to, to me was very satisfying. Okay. Um, and in a way, a, a ghost story, but not kind of your traditional ghost story. And, and I thought it was really good. And way, um, way more meat on the bones than you get a lot of times from movies like this. It's not, it's not just your kind of average horror movie. So if you have Shudder, um, I would definitely say give it a, give it a try. And it, it's cool and a different take on this sort of um, folktale. I have a recommendation before we get to you, Eric. It's called The Silencing. I, I covered this last week on Cinematics, but comes out on VOD and digital August 14th very quickly. Are, are you guys a, were you guys a fan of Game of Thrones? Nikolai Coster Waldau. He is the known as the Kingslayer from Got. Eric, did you ever watch King of Thrones? Game of Thrones? I saw the uh, I saw part of the first episode and that was it. And that we was didn't it. have HBO I anymore, you so I, I, I didn't want to. You just my my friend, uh, my friend Chuck, though he was reading the books and he was lamenting about the sh series coming out. He's like, "Oh, they're gonna mess it up because ball." And he started telling me all the stuff in the books. I'm like, "Oh, that sounds really cool." And then so, but then it turned out he actually liked the TV show. But yeah, yeah I, well, I saw the first episode and never went back to it. The last, I I really loved uh, God, but the last season just I would say don't even don't even try because the last season just throws everything away but anyways Nikolai Koster Waldau he is he played the Kingslayer on Game of Thrones he is the lead character in the silencing he plays a guy who who manages a wildlife reserve area in on somewhere up in Canada specifically I think Ontario and he's an alcoholic he has he has bad memories from the past several years ago his daughter wound up missing somewhere up up in that area where he lives and he's on a mission to find out where his daughter is who kidnapped and presumably presumably murdered his daughter that killer is still out there in that area so the silencing centers on his attempts to track and figure out who and where the killer is also it stars annabelle wallace as the local sheriff who helps who i guess has her own sort of investigation into who this killer is because there's been a a string of 
just dead bodies, you know, women showing up in, in the river in the area. So yeah, it, it looks like it's a basically a serial killer thriller film. Doesn't seem completely, we've seen so many of these movies. The thing that really worked for me was the leads are good. Annabelle Wallace, you've seen her in The Mummy or maybe not. She was also in Peaky Blinders. She's a good actress, but Nikolai is a, good, a really good leading man. There's something that happens in the middle of the movie that is a complete what the what the f happened right now moment that birthday that, party what, what, sorry is it a birthday party it's a birthday party it's it's a definitely yeah blow out the candles it is something really crazy happens in the middle of the film that makes this that just turns everything on its head and once that twist or situation happens then the rest of the movie picks up on another level we were talking about spree how whether how much we liked it in different degrees we wanted it to go to another level we all agreed it didn't go to another level and the silencing to me after the first half the the latter part of the movie it goes up a different level for me so i ended up really enjoying the silencing i gave it i, I mean i remember on cinematics said a three and a half for me last week but then again it's weird because I guess you, you guys know this. When you see a movie a week later, you still think about it. And sometimes you want to upscale the review. And mm-hmm. I would say it's not a four-star film. It's still 3.5, but oh, 3.5 with, with an asterisk, meaning there's a great what the F moment. And it still <laughs> lingers with you. It still ling- lingers. <laughs> that asterisk is Greg Scherzavosti's butthole puckering because it's not four stars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, listeners, if you are looking at, if you don't look at, I'm, I'm doing oh, something with my move. fingers. I'm squeezing, in my- <laughs> I'm squeezing something with my fingers, and that's unintentional. I was just uh, <laughs> measuring my worth as a human being, and it looks like a little ant. That's what I was trying to do. <laughs> I was subconsciously doing that, folks. So if you're if you're missing our YouTube feed, you're missing a lot. It's uh, available on Rusto Meyer, R U S T O M I R E, Rusto Meyer at Bruce Perky's channel. You can see our our find your film feed there. And the reason why I pimped that out is I'm exactly going back to spree, exactly like Kurt, except I don't murder people and I drink my water bottle sans the poison. But yeah, the silencing comes out on Friday, August 14th. I, I hopefully one of you guys checks it out. I, um, I, I, I ended up really enjoying the movie. It is not excellent. It has flaws, but 3.5 solid film. So, yeah. It's an asterisk. <laughs> asterisk, asterisk. No asterisk for Eric Holmes. Eric Holmes is ast- straight ahead. Terrific. He, he hits between. The t- it's an asterisk. <laughs> yes. Yes. Eric Holmes. Oh, no. what is you- and what does an asterisk zero. look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not. That's not. <laughs> First, first of all, uh, with uh, La Llorona, Bruce, you mentioned ethnic cleansing. Th- this probably isn't the show for this, but uh, you, you think the ethnic cleansing just sounds like – you actually just cut this out. It, it sounds too <laughs> nice for what it is. Like, oh, right. Genocide. Yeah, like guess, genocide. Yeah. Oh, genocide. Genocide. Was like, I genocide. know. It, yeah. Not genocide. It was just a little ethnic cleansing. Not that big. Like, it, it – doesn't that sound like it's sugarcoating what it actually is? Yeah, just go with gen- just just go with genocide. We're, we're gonna just cut this out. This is useless. No, no, no. no. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm totally. I'm I'm becoming Kurt from Spree. <laughs> Folks, leave us in the comments. Tell us what you think. Smash a like. You know. Uh, you know. Share share the links. Do do whatever. So. Yo, it's your boy Eric Holmes. Smash that like button, leave a comment down in the sections, and at the end, I'm gonna kill a kid on camera to get likes. Yo, <laughs> we're gonna go viral. Yo. <laughs> That is, folks, that is the overview of Spree. Whether you, I don't know if that'll make you want to see that movie. But okay, so Eric Holmes, uh, you have another pick for us? Another movie pick? I did, but I'm calling an audible. Um, oh, nice. Very cool. I like this. Uh, well, maybe not. Have, have you both oh. seen uh, Investigation of a Citizen Above Suspicion? Nope. That, that name sounds very familiar. Okay, we'll have moniker. to save that then. Um <laughs> Because that, that's a really good one. And I think maybe we should probably do a spoiler on that one because that, that movie is really, really good. Okay. Uh, sh- short version is it's a uh, 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 citizen above suspicion and he commits a murder and he's part of the, uh, the police force that, that uh, well, I mean, I'm not talking about that one. I want to wait till you guys see it and oh, then I will okay. talk about it. All right. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about instead and by the way, watch an investigation of a citizen 
above suspicion. I, okay. Uh, keep investigation. Above, I think I got it right. Above suspicion. Okay. Wrote it down. Write that down. It, it, it's like a Criterion movie. Um, but uh, the one I'll talk about, and actually kind of makes sense with the whole theme of Spree in Ms. 45, is a movie directed by Stuart Gordon, oh. uh, written by David Mamet mm. uh, from 2005, starring William H. Macy. It's called yeah. Edmund. Yes, Edmund. I need to see this movie. And this one, um, I'll, I'll just read this like I did Ms. 45. <laughs> A fortune teller's teasing rumination sends Edmund Berg lurching into the New York City's hellish underworld. Another New York movie. Um, Edmund is a guy, he, he's kind of like one of those, uh, uh, he's the kind of guy you would see at a bar. It's like, you know, the problem with things today, people just aren't polite anymore. And another problem with things today is people don't do this anymore. And they don't do that anymore. And they start, they start getting in this role, as he does, and um, then their their annoyances turn into hate, and then their hate turns into rage, and then their rage turns into they're not good people anymore. And that's exactly what happens with Edmund, and um, his character just like uh, you know, it, it's kind of similar to Falling Down, where uh, Michael Keaton's character like you know just had enough, and he goes on. And and the thing about uh falling down is there comes a point where Michael Keaton's or Michael Douglas's character, sorry. Uh, Michael Douglas's character realizes that, Oh no, I'm the bad guy. And so that's what it, that's what it builds to spoiler alert for falling down, but it's a wicked sweet and you should watch it anyway. Um, with, with Edmund, he never gets to that point. He just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and just keeps doing worse and worse. It's similar to miss 45. Um, although I, uh, it's hard to tell with Miss Forty Five because she's a mute. I never got the sense that she was trying to forgive herself for what she was doing. She was just kind of fine with doing it. Um, she was welcoming Ed, the abyss. It seems her character. Yeah, I can't wait to uh, it. Edmund's constantly trying to um, forgive what he's doing or uh, try to make excuses for what he's doing. Because I'm not the problem. They're the problem. I see the world how it is, man. You don't see the world. The world's a shit place, and I'm just trying to clean it up. I'm just trying to clean up the streets. Why has everyone got to mess everything up? Not me, man. I'm not the problem. You're the problem, man. That's kind of that's kind of what Edmund is. And it, does it, it just feel like of, a play, Eric Holmes? Does it feel like a play, or it, it doesn't matter because it's such a no. it's such a good. Okay. No, he's, he's constantly going. It, it, it's similar to uh, uh, Miracle Mile, actually, mm. in the sense that they're constantly moving. He's constantly moving from one place to another. He kills a pimp, then he goes to a you know, uh, finds this one girl, and then he uh, uh, she's part of the problem too, and he kills her, and and like he just keeps going around killing people until uh, the ending. I don't want to get into the ending, but the ending did not end where I thought it would. Okay, it, is, that, is, uh, is that a disappointing thing or is that an okay thing? No, no, not at all. No, it, it was. Uh, it's you ever see an ending where it's like, oh, that's not where I thought this was going. Yeah, but I'm not at all disappointed with it either. Like I, I was kind of thinking it was going this oh, way, but very cool. That this is an interesting way to go too, and it kind of ends up there. And I, the you know. It's written by David Mamet, directed by Stuart Gordon. How could this not be great? But for some reason, it just kind of, it, it, it never, uh... dude, Stuart Gordon, David yeah. Mamet, why hasn't everyone seen this? But that, that <laughs> I was don't the know. case, I even for me. Either. I came out in 2005 and, you know, I saw it like a year ago and then just, just this last weekend. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, I could, this is one of those movies I could see, you know, when uh, people watch a movie and they assume that what the character is doing is what the filmmakers are condoning. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's like, Oh, this movie condones this, this, and this, because that's what the characters did. Well, no, sometimes they like to show the character saying this, look at this piece of shit. Look what the, you know, look what this character did. Look what the uh, spiral, this character fell down. Don't do that. And, but we'll get to see what happens. We get to see what happens when. Oh, yep, not a good place. Who knew? I did. That's why I made a movie about it. And, <laughs> 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 um, 
uh, yeah, to, to, I, I could see people misconstruing Edmund as a, uh, you know, this is how to, this is how life should be. It's not, it's, 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 if it's not an indictment on that, I have, I worry about David Mamet and I, you know, I know he's like right wing and everything. I don't think he's quite, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't imagine anyone in their right mind would side with uh, William H. Mason's character. in this. Well, you mentioned, you mentioned Stuart Gordon. Okay. And David Mamet. And do you feel that Edmund then it, it's just one of those movies that, and hopefully we get to do this, all three of us. It's just one of those movies that just really unfortunately slipped through the cracks and hasn't gotten enough of a spotlight on it over the years. And hopefully it gets a little bit more love. Do you think it's that good of a movie, Eric, to just bring it out to the forefront? Well, I think uh, I, after watching it, I think what happened with this, because I remember it having bad reviews, but I think a lot of the reviews are exactly what I said, where people mistook this as, um, you know, the the character saying this is how life should be like the characters condoning this behavior i think a lot of the maybe the uh, critics or like uh and, and i don't want to put words in their mouth but i suspect that they're like uh oh yeah i don't want to condone this kind of behavior and this uh movie is definitely uh, glorifying this kind of behavior because you know edmund's life ends up complete shit going down this horrible downward spiral of course everyone would want to emulate that because everyone's so uh <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think it I'm guessing it got unfairly panned. Um no, I, I mean look, it's the movie. I mean if if it ends up being lost forever, you know, it's not the end of the world. But I think this is a really good one and you should check it out. Okay. Edmund, um you saw it on YouTube or you, you just paid for it or you No, I, the uh uh the uh DVD. DV, DVD? Yeah. Okay, DVD. Yeah. It, it might be on YouTube. It, everything's on YouTube, so probably. Eric, uh, before we go, do you have one more? Because I'm going to close out with Bruce Perky. Do you have one more quick one? A little, uh, little uh, shot shot in the thing? or no, I, I, I was going to do uh, investigation of a citizen above suspicion, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. I, I yeah. really want you guys to watch that one and kind of go into some things on that one. But it, we don't necessarily have to do it next week, but I want to get it with you guys at some point for sure. Uh, possibly in a spoiler episode. So that's all I got for today. Eric Holmes, close your ears. Bruce, why don't we, why don't we lie and say we actually did it and actually review Bumblebee for next week? <laughs> that, that'll be, and just say it's oh, the second coming of Lady Bird. It's the second coming of Lady Bird. Wow. Lady B. Michael Bay does an even better job than Greta Gerwig. Then it should have, this should have been Lady Bird. He Lady should have Bumblebee. done Little Women. Why didn't he do Little Women? <laughs> It would have been because uh, fucking Harvey robots Weinstein was fighting doing all other. the little women. <laughs> so Bruce, Bucky, you're going to close us out one of these days. Not, I, you know what? I haven't seen Bumblebee. I, uh, I haven't I don't either. Know, one of these, I don't want to. Mm-hmm. Eric Holmes, I, I, I am these days. I'm all about humanity. We're we're all sheltered in place. We we can be very divisive. I pray one day that all three of us get really passionate in a good way about a Michael Bay film. It won't be one of these little asterisky, little smally things. We're going to have our hearts open and we're going to say, Michael Bay, this is pure cinema. I Eric? don't. Okay. I don't hate that idea. Okay. But, but, but if, if it doesn't have to be Michael Bay, but I do like the idea of picking a movie and the three of us are going to agree to love it. Whether or not we actually do, but if we don't love it, we're going to watch it again until we force ourselves to love this movie that's probably really bad. It might be our last podcast and we might not survive. Bruce Perky, what is your, what is your final close you us know, out Garbage on this? Pale Kids movie really yeah. is the best movie. <laughs> Say, Tammy and the T-Rex, let's do it. All right. The Snowman, I, I know people give the Snowman shit, man. It's, it's an underrated masterpiece. It is. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh man, Rebecca Ferguson was so done wrong in that movie. But okay, Bruce Perky loved well, her in that movie, but she was so hor- horrible in that movie. Okay, anyways, but. I have one that is available on YouTube. It's also available on Shutter. It's available a whole bunch of places, um, and it's a tie-in to our uh, Bava and Argento episode, and that is um, Black Sabbath, aka. Three Faces of Fear, 
and uh, it is his 1963 anthology, which I'm pretty sure, like Bad Company, inspired some <laughs> band to name themselves Black Sabbath. <laughs> um, this is Mario Bava, of course. And the main reason I bring it up is uh, it's a great anthology from that era. Uh, it's got one of one of the stories is one of the very one of the very last performances by um, Boris Karloff, and okay. he's awesome in it. Um, but I just want to highlight there's other three stories. There's one that if you don't even watch the whole thing, I would highly suggest you watch uh, the story in here called A Drop of Water, and it's about 20 minutes long. And depends on which version you find. So YouTube has both versions. If it's the US version, A Drop of Water is the first segment. If it's the Italian version, which I would suggest is usually a higher quality one, I think on YouTube too, A Drop of Water is the last, ep- the last story. And A Drop of Water, if you watch the one where it's the last story, I think it starts at about the hour eight minute mark. If you wanted to skip the others, I would say watch the whole thing. But A Drop of Water is a textbook of one of the creepiest, best scary short films that you'll ever see so beautiful and it's beautiful and it's got everything that baba does great it's got the impeccable set design it's got the insane um shot choices it's got the beautiful lighting which we'll talk in much more detail about but he's an expert in lighting and cinematography uh and i'll just sort the basic story is don't steal anything from a dead body. That's all I got to say. Just never steal something from a dead body. It doesn't go well. A drop of water. Have you there. seen Black Sabbath, uh, Eric? Is that, the, uh, is that the black and white one? No, or it's color. Okay. You're thinking, so this is the weird thing about Baba. He did two super famous films almost at the same time. One's called Black Sunday and one's called Black Sabbath. And black okay, I definitely, I definitely saw Black Sunday then if that's yeah. a black and white one. Black yeah. Sabbath, maybe. I have to watch it again because um, yeah. we watched it. We watched a bunch of Mario Bava movies back when we were doing Splatter House. Yeah. Pretty sure I have, but I have to watch it again. It, either way, it's been a long time since I've seen it. And weirdly, these not. are all based on like classic stories. Like one's based on a Chekhov story. One's based on a Toll story story. So it's, it's a very, um, you know, it's really shooting for the moon for a movie in 1963 to try to do these things. It's, it's a horror movie. It's straight up. Uh, but, that drop of water is is one of the best short story slash short films for horror that you'll you'll ever see. It's excellent. Okay, that that wraps up another episode of Find Your Film. We had a, a really good conversation on on a lot of movies. Uh, Bruce Perky, you're going to lead us out. What can we expect from from the Argento and Baba episode? Just very quickly, just uh, thoughts. I think, well, (laughs) the number one thing I think you should look for is how Greg reacts to this. And this is what both Eric and I have been excited to, to, to find out uh, is what is his um, reaction going to be to this movie, these movies and these two filmmakers. Um, I feel like for a lot of people, if you haven't encountered either of them, this should be two pieces of movie history that you can kind of add to your collection and it just will help you especially if you're into horror or thrillers from the 70s and 80s on, it will give you a context that you may not have had before to really understand like how impactful these two Italian filmmakers are. Essentially, they do for horror what Leone did for Westerns. Well, all right, with that. And I, I just want to say for, uh, with Find Your Film, I, I think one of the things with Baba, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming with Argento and my favorite director, De Palma, Albert Hitchcock, all these great masters of compositions and uh, painterly, some, some of them are even painterly, as like Fritz Lang. The, as opposed to today when everyone can grab a camera, I think, and you know, Eric Holmes, you're, you're about indie filmmaking and, and all that stuff. And I, I am too. We, we all love indie movies. The thing I think is lacking sometimes these days is how to actually frame a shot yes and sometimes you don't have time sometimes you don't have time because of your budget or your location you just have to get the coverage you got to get your shot you got to make sure everything's fine and you just got to get make the movie i understand that but i think um there comes a time i I can't wait to watch suspiria but i i think we need more of these filmmakers who really look at cinema as a visual medium 
Yes. There has to be. There has to be more of that. You know, television is great when we have all these really interesting shows, but no matter how much you spend on the FX or the star talent, they're always going to be, it's always going to be about the narrative, the meat, the meat of it, right? What it's about, the narrative. But cinema allows us to go to these different places and to, you know, I was thinking years ago, there's this Mandy Moore movie that I forgot the name of it. And I, I think it was, I forgot who's, who directed Heathers. I forgot who directed Heathers, but Lehman or something, one of those guys. But I, I wondered, I'm it was just an, now. it was an uninterestingly shot movie. I, I, it was a romantic comedy. And I was thinking, why can't more directors just, if you're going to have a safe movie, whether it be a rom-com or like you're saying, like with Spree, why not make it more visually interesting? Just make it. Sometimes people say, oh, you're going to make it so showy. You're going to show your, like a, you're going to show off too much. But Bruce, don't you agree in a sense that it's. You're just leaving one of your tools behind. I mean, when you're making a movie, you have the visuals, you have the words, you have the acting and you have the sound. And if you just decide to take one of those and just throw it out and just make it as boring as possible, why? And that's why when we see, when you see a movie that does it all, it, it, pulls you in and some can do one way more than the other you know like you get Woody Allen he might be really really excellent on the script and maybe not quite as visual in some of his movies but some of his movies like Manhattan are amazingly visual with a great DP right yeah yeah. and so I mean that's why when you see a movie like you know Baba and Suspiria and we'll talk way more detail about it but these are little low budget horror movies but they take the time to compose a shot and to light a shot so that when you look at it you're like damn that's beautiful and that is something they didn't have to do, but the fact they did do it elevates it. The only excuses you have, Eric, I don't know if you agree with it, if you're not know, know how to, A, if you're not gonna make an interesting movie visually, A, maybe because you don't have the budget for it or the time, or B, you just don't have the talent. And I, you know, I think both those, both those elements are excusable, but. I, I, I don't know that it necessarily takes money to no. point a camera in an interesting direction. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like no, that. Uh, that okay. camera shot looks pretty flat. Yeah, but if you had paid me a thousand dollars, I would do this with the camera <laughs> and make it look great. But, but you didn't at, pay. You paid me ten dollars, so it's staying right here. We just talked about PTA's short. Look at PTA's yeah. first short, or look at Eraserhead for God's sake. Yeah. Look at Eraserhead. That thing was made for how much? And right, three dollars. Amazing. <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, uh, the director of Heather's, uh, Michael Lehman, director of Hudson Hawk and Airheads. So oh, yeah, yeah. three no, masterpieces. No, no, no. You know, he's, he's quite the director and uh, he's quite the director. He did, I think he did a movie with Manny Moore or something like that. But I was, yeah, I was thinking like, hey, this is Michael Lehman. He has the skills to, I remember, he has the skills hey, the to bills. direct. Which one? What were we saying? He has the skills to pay the bills. He has the skills to pay. He does have the skills to pay the bills. If you're if you're if you're going to direct a rom com or or safe movie, make it interest. Make it an inter- Look, if you're going to be part of a, a a movie that's not going to be an A list story, you can screw around with it. Like De Palma does. Sometimes he has really bad scripts, but he makes them interesting visually, at least. So, enough of the rant. How, um, how dare you, Greg? I apologize for the rant. Okay, we will be back with our the gentleman. Palma takes novel. bad bad scripts and weaves them into masterpieces. You of all people should know oh, this. I know. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's I'm gonna strike that out. I, I um that was a moment of weakness. But we're gonna have a moment of strength tomorrow as Bruce Perky will lead us into the Argento Bava world. Until then, uh, Eric Holmes, sign us off. Bye. <laughs>